The Thief's Sin, written by J.T. Williams, a short story set in the Stormborn Saga timeline. Copyright 2019. Part 1. On the Eve of the Fall. Water dripped from a high place in the guild hall into a pool to the right of Melia's seat. This was her throne, if she could actually name it. She was never found here. She much preferred a spot in the local tavern. There were better rumors to be heard and leads to be followed. She hated formalities, but in this case, it was warranted. She flipped a knife in her hand. Melia, as leader of one of the guilds of thieves in Sela, had to at least act like she did not think her prize thief Risa would not come back with the sacred artifact she had been sent to retrieve. It was a setup anyway. Risa had her own path, and between the two of them, they had been searching for this particular item. Now they arrived back in Scylla. It was time to deal with what she had to. The two of them arrived nearly at the same time, taking the centre bridge over the city sewer rivers that passed through the guild hall. It wasn't the best place to the opinion of many, but it was their pit, their hideaway, in the shamble that was the city of Scylla. I see you did return, Milia said. Of course, I would not let my guild mother down. They both smiled at one another. She cheated, the other guild member said. You said we could take no form of transportation other than our own two feet to retrieve the artifact from the tower, but she somehow used the sand cow. Milia stood up making her way down from her chair of broken barrels and nailed together planks set within the inner sanctum of the Thieves' Guild. Oh, you feel Ressa cheated, Milia said mockingly. You feel you've been treated unfairly? That perhaps your great leader would somehow know that you would fail this challenge? This random thief, lanky and fairly useful in many other situations, had recently been revealed to be working for a rival gang. But you see, the issue is, I knew of your deceit, and Scylla is not quite the city, it was not too long ago. The Rus's priestesses have fled, the city cuts its own throat, and this ancient island quakes with earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. So as I see it, our guild has many problems that it must deal with now beyond your foolishness. This thief was visibly shaking. Sweat poured from his forehead. Without prompting, he fell to his knees. Please, master. I am but a lowly servant of the thieves' guild. I have not betrayed you. Show me mercy. Milia stood before the thief, knowing full well that there were others who had not arrived at the end of the sewer trap. The sewer trap was a long passageway starting from the base of one of the old towers of the fortress that stood upon Scylla's northernmost point and led directly to their hideout. She had already moved most of her guards to intercept points along the way, and the rival gang have been seeking out exactly what her own lover, Risa, had retrieved. They would come soon. Milia laughed. Oh, you beg for my mercy now. But I am not a god. I will not show mercy. Milia swiped the knife directly across the exposed neck of the lowly thief, spilling his blood in a rhythmic, pulsing sanguine below that ran upon the ground of the thieves' guild main hall. There were many other thieves present, loyal guild members. The ground quaked and shook. There are times when our actions forsake any chance of mercy. This was one of them, Milia said, cleaning her dagger. Is Scylla to fall? Ressa asked. The city is in an uproar. People are fleeing. We must deal with sooner troubles before worrying of this city. At that moment, there were several explosions near the door of the guild hall. They are here! Milia shouted out to the others. Milia and Reza both had their own silver fire rods up and ready. No one survived in Sela without some form of magic. 
and neither of them were like the priestesses, who were all Rusi's casters. But fellow thieves had many weapons, and some were more intelligent than others. As their gateway burned, through the rolling ashes and smoke walked four cloaked individuals. They held other members of Milia's thieves' guild. Do not cast, Milia shouted to the others. While some had bows and could land arrows to kill the rival guild members, they couldn't kill all of them, and considering some were alive, it looked as if they wished to parley in some form. Milia, one of the cloaked individuals said. Tritnu? Why do you bring your guild here? Do you not know the city falls into ruin? The shadow elf before her flashed a parchment. I am aware of such, and have secured passage to the Shadowlands. My guild hall is destroyed. We leave immediately. Then good, be gone with your rabble from my hall and leave those you have captured. He grinned. I just need my source of payment and I will depart. A ship awaits on the far southern coast, and the scroll your disgusting wretch of a woman took is the exact item I need. Find yourself your own scroll, Risa said. I didn't come here to ask you, whore. Risa approached Milia and kissed her on the cheek. An honest whore. At least give me credit. Risa laughed. I told him he'd never get me so easily, but he still was willing to betray you for a taste of me. I have dealt with the weakness in my own ranks, but of that... Tritnu shouted. You have no say in. Give me the scroll or die. I have reported the location of this place to the priestesses. They come for you. Liar! Ressa shouted. The priestesses departed. There was a breakout in the arena. Something else moves upon this island, and they have gone north. Tritnu seemed annoyed, grimacing toward Ressa. Worse still comes. Shadow beasts move across Ayaklo. The island is falling into darkness. Already the city fights them along the outer walls on the western side. Tritnu reached out. Hand me the scroll and we can all escape. You have my word. Your word is trivial and I will not give you this scroll, Milia shouted. Thieves of Silia, honour your mother. Those held by the rival guild broke vials that each of the guild members held around their necks. They coughed and fell limp. The ones holding them dropped the now quivering bodies. Tritnu looked on in disgust. The remaining members of Milia's guild advanced, holding up their weapons. Tritnu and his few allies now stared at spear points and arrows drawn back to Milia's minion's cheeks. Get out of my hall! she shouted. You would kill your own members to keep this scroll? Tritnu questioned. It allows us passage into a temple in the south, a place rumoured to have more power than any other place in our region. This is folly, Tritnu told her. You are willing to lose everything for this then? There was a moment of staring between Milia and Tritnu and she noticed his eyes traced behind them. There was a way that was unknown to most, a storm drain in the yard of an abandoned house in a ruined section of Sela. You had to know it was there to even enter it, but his eyes told a story, and he had no plans to back down. He was patient, calculating. His eyes were focused on her, but he wasn't looking at her. The other entrance the secret entrance. She spun around, casting a ball of fire with her wand, striking the veiled pathway behind her. There was a shout, and Tritnu and the others sprang into action, moving through arrow fire and spear points. From their flank, several clumped up rival guild members attempting to assail Milia's guild from behind fell through the flames of her spell, but others were coming. Reza and Milia made for one of their other escapes. A haphazard path, but one where they had a chance. 
Milia pulled a lever by her throne, revealing a passage that her, Risa, and a few other guild members leaped down. She rolled into the darkness, using her wand to light up the room they had made it to. She quickly reached for a lever and flooded the level above them in the same gas that her guild members had used to kill themselves. She moved another lever and collapsed the path behind them. I told you that was a good investment, Risa said with a smile. Come on, Milia said, leading Risa and two other guild members forward. This way was old. Not that much of Cilia was new or kept in good condition. But unlike other pathways and passages, this one was not routinely checked or followed. There was a stream of what liquid Melia could only guess running down the centre of the passage and many other openings in the rocks that she cared little to slow down long enough to check. The ground trembled beneath their feet and above their heads. Rocks fell down around them, doing nothing but spurring them forward. They reached an opening that led up a slope of loose dirt to the outside world and a bit of fresh air compared to the depths below that just caused them all to cough. Ayaklo, the island Silir, sat upon, like a rancid hive of villainy in the lower glacial seas, was dying. The skies, black with ash and soot, and the already dilapidated state of the city, were pale comparisons to the upheaval of the already broken people fleeing now. As Milia and the others made their way toward the southern gate, doors slammed shut at houses where the people could not flee, and the priestess's guardsmen moved toward the wall. It was no army, but they were at least armed. The shadow beasts move across the eastern perimeter, one of them shouted. They are in the city. Raisa asked. The guard didn't speak to her, and it was then Milia noticed that the gates to the south weren't shut. They're fleeing, she said. Suddenly, there was screaming in the distance. Milia noticed blackness, like fog rolling across a lake surface, flowing over the top of the southern wall. She grabbed Risa's arm. We cannot go this way! A dagger struck one of the other guild members. Melia turned to see Tritnu and the others running down the path some distance away. Defend your guild mother! Risa shouted. The remaining guild member drew her sword, and Risa pulled Melia away. We leave them, she asked. They do their part. They were moving east toward another gate that was no doubt open as well but did not have the encroaching flow of shadow beasts moving over the wall like to the south. Shadow beasts were an inherent part of the island, living in the dark recesses to the north, hiding away during the daytime and feasting on the living at night. The priestess sect that Rancilia protected the city, but the Rusis casters, the elemental magic users of the sect, had left the city. Milia had heard of the upheaval at the arena, how a phoenix escaped when it was supposed to die. There was mention of a bounty on two people, a man and a woman, but the details were lost to her and she didn't care. She had Risa and the scroll, truly the only two things she cared about. They moved into an abandoned and dark section of the city. Where is everyone? Melia asked. Reza drew her wand, holding the silver shaft of her weapon up into the darkness as they moved down the main road. They looked behind them and down a slight hill that gave them a view of the rest of the city. Smoke rose in the southern portions, and the screaming continued. We're in the high reach. There should be more people here. Where did everyone go? They moved forward, keeping close to the shanties and being careful to not make too much noise. Risa put down her wand, drawing her sword, to which Milia did the same. There aren't even any guards this way, Risa said. This isn't normal. They cut down an alley. 
This would lead them to another main road and the actual gateway. As they moved between several broken down boxes, they found three bodies of the city guard with missing chunks from their necks. These weren't assassinations, Melia said. Coming to the edge of the alley, they looked around the corner to see the gates were open and broken. Blackness flowed through the door, and with it came beasts running down the main path they had just been on. Their only weakness is normally, they are dormant unless you make yourself obvious. These, though, she shook her head. They are intent on swarming the city for whatever reason stirs them. I wish we had one of those priestesses or light of ether. Do you not have any left? No, I used it getting this, Risa said, holding up the scroll. But that is one of the few items they are afraid of. The divine goddess seems to have the ability to push them back. But still, these seem intent on the city. Let's go up the wall and make it over. There are no guards, so we should have some luck. They moved out onto the main street, still hugging the buildings and attempting to not draw the attention of the shadow beasts. Milia worked to catch up with Reza, who, if the guild mother was being honest, was much more fit than her. She had broken her leg some time ago and had taken a less than forward place in the guild's activities, but Risa was strong and a confident leader. If anyone was to ever challenge her status, it would be her. But they were lovers, and Risa had no desire to take her place. She enjoyed the heist too much, and by default, she liked being the servant to her guild mother, which she took to strongly, ready to serve at a moment's notice. This was no truer than today. As they came to a place where they were about to cross over and run toward the grey walls and a dilapidated section of the crumbling structure, Risa placed her hand on Melia's chest. Wait! Risa scanned the area in front of them, and Melia noticed a figure hunched over a body. Risa leaped forward, lunging at this figure but stopping just short of striking. A woman looked up with swollen red eyes. Beneath her, crushed into a piece of stone, was a young boy. Risa stepped back, looking as Melia approached. You are of the priestesses? the woman asked, almost as if begging it to be true. I... we, Melia said. We are. What is it? They killed him. They killed all of them. You must help me. Risa pulled Milia away, but Milia resisted. Go, flee from this place. He is dead. But at this moment, Milia noticed the woman had red flesh in her teeth. Her hands were not soft, but clawed. I cannot leave him. I am not done. Devouring him. They came within me. They told me to eat him. I smashed his head like I will smash. Risa's blade pierced the woman's skull and she fell dead. Possession. She pulled Milia toward the wall. Come now. They climbed up the ruined wall and Milia looked toward the city once again. Fires had broken out all through Cilia. She had been in this city since she was fourteen and at a mere twenty-three now, she felt strange leaving. But looking toward Risa as she climbed up through a hole in the wall that she could barely squeeze through, she did not feel she was leaving anything of true value behind. The guild had already been raided once before, and many of her other followers were killed. This was their last heist, and now... It was their last chance in a world that was burning around them. They left Scylla, moving toward the great icy lake that they referred to as the Cold One. It was one of two massive lakes. The one to the east of the city was fire, and the one to the west, this one, kept a constant icy haze just on its surface. 
Legend spoke that there was some form of magic underneath the lake that kept the water cold, with the contrast being the fiery one and something that burned from when Ayeklo was much different. The ground was still trembling, but they had made it to the shore of the lake and one of the abandoned towers that overlooked the water. Risa quickly pushed Melia in, just as several shadow beasts ran through the area. Milia exhaled, watching as their forms passed around the tower, swarming in a mass of gnashing teeth towards Celia. She began to cry when Risa pressed her lips against hers. Too long. Don't worry of the others for now. Milia returned the kiss as the two of them lay on one another. They stared out to the lake, feeling a strange churning beneath the ground that vibrated constantly. What is that? Melia asked. I don't know, but we are safe, I think, for now, Risa said with a smile. They embraced and held one another. A figure appeared out of nowhere, floating before them. It was a tiny man wearing a coat of many colours and laughing. You have escaped tribulation so far, good, good. But what now? What shall you do? You shall give me what was taken, for it was not yours to take. Damn genie, I know what you are. Go, Risa shouted. Go, but where? Where shall I go? I shall go here. I have a sand cow and I can get you to the coast. Just give me the scroll you took from our goddess. It was lost, and now it is found. Good, good, just give it over. Screw off, Risa shouted. Go play your games elsewhere. The genie floated in place in the doorway. Genies were very rare. Akin to the djinn of stories in other regions, these were more playful and tricksters to be sure. This one stared at them with an odd expression of pride. You two are strong. Avoided the shadows. Good, good. Now you give me what is mine, and I shall help you. Yes, yes. I said screw off, Risa said, drawing her wand. I care little for your weapons, the genie said. Last chance, give it to me. Give it to me now, or great risk you put yourself in. Risa looked at Melia. These genies are tricksters. I can get us to the coast. There is no guarantee he will do so. Go on, Melia told him. We do not want your help. But you shall have it in a form and in time. It has been decided. There was a flash, and he vanished. A floating substance in the air smelled sweet to Melia. She then saw Ressa falling asleep. And though she tried... She could not keep her eyes open. Part 2. Awakening. Milia awoke in a startle, reaching out at first for Ressa, but discovering they had both awoken at the same time. They looked for the genie, but he was long gone. In fact, everything had changed. The air on her skin felt... different. But it wasn't until she stood up from the crumbled tower and went outside that she nearly collapsed. Celia, what remained of the city, was nothing but ash and bright red molten rock. The sky swirled, the clouds like a massive storm with the nexus of the clouds in the centre of the island. What has happened? she said, looking to Risa. Light flashed in the far distance, toward the centre of the island. Risa pushed past her, looking around the tower to the opposite way and across the Black Reach. We need to go. There is still a path to the sea. I think we can make it. The quaking from before had stilled. Though the land didn't resemble what it was before they'd fallen asleep, it seemed almost frozen in place. There was no wind, even though the clouds spun above them. Are we dead? she asked. Ressa rolled her eyes and grabbed Milia by her armour, kissing her. She doesn't feel dead, that's for sure. 
Now, if you're done asking dumb questions, we should get moving. They descended the now crag of rock that had been spared in the shifting of the island of Ayeklo. They walked down a narrow path that formed a bridge between two large towers of stone. Beneath them, lava flowed down into the deep recesses of the island. When they made it to a middle point between the large expanse beneath them and the rocky ground of the other side, Milia turned to find that there were buildings visible beneath them. At first, she thought it was ruined portions of Celia, but the structures were curved and had broken crystals adorning portions of the stone. Ressa, I won't ask another stupid question, but look! Ressa turned, seeing that Milia seemed awestruck. Then it's true, Ressa said, the old stories, the ones about Iclo that a city was underneath the rock. That Ayeklo is a city, an ancient city, lost to time, and it is why the Lake of Fire and the Lake of Moon exist. There was an old power beneath the stone of the island, Dwemha energies. Now who sounds like they lost their mind? Milia teased. I'm not making this up, Reza said. It is why the island is so strange that there are towers that no one knows who built on the outer portions of the island. Somehow, the eruptions have revealed them. The ground shook, and the lava seemed to move beneath them even more so. Still, Reza said, we need to go. She checked for the scroll. Milia noticed and wondered why the genie had put them to sleep, and instantly, the horror that the genie did so to steal the scroll crossed her mind. We still have it. I figured we would. You trusted the genie? No, she said, beginning up the rocky path leading up to the other side of the chasm. But he asked us. We have to allow him to do anything. It is part of the difference between genies and jinn. A genie is mostly benevolent with a dark side, of course. But it will not surprise me if he comes again. They continued up the path and down a dusty hill where two large slabs of stone had crushed over one another. Further on, the desert opened up to them, and they began to make a clear and straight path, heading toward the southern coast. They could feel the black sand beneath their feet, and the heat from the stones to their right. As they progressed, the soft hills turned to ragged and rocky sheer walls that rose high on their right side. Milia was happy they had survived, but she did not know what to think of the supposed fortune they'd had to have been safe, is that solitary tower while the rest of the island shifted around them. It didn't make sense, but neither did what she saw ahead. With some amount of luck, they had come across an abandoned caravan. Ressa kicked through some of the broken parts of wagons, and Milia rummaged through a sackcloth bag. She found a pouch of water that had been left. I don't think they abandoned it. There's blood here. Shadow beasts? Likely, Milia said. I found water, but not much else. Risa brushed off her hands. Well, others have escaped. I just wonder how many. Any of ours, you think? Or theirs? Milia shook her head, and they began to walk again. But she saw a figure hiding in the rocks to their right. The landscape had changed so much that she wasn't sure what she was seeing in the smoke and fires that glowed in the distance. But she kept an eye toward the rocks and saw the figure move. We're being watched. I know. Risa, who had been walking in front of her, now fell back to her side. It isn't Shadow Beasts, which is both good and bad. This land is already in complete upheaval. Who would attack the two of us? We need to work together to get off this rock. Risa held up her wand in her right hand almost letting those watching know they were seen. 
May they all find lying whores who give them cockrot if they come near us. Risa shook her wand. Do you hear me? She shouted. Come near us and I'll make sure this island doesn't kill you, you foul-faced gremlins. The figures seemed to keep staring, and now more were popping up. They came to an area where the path sank between two large spires of rock. Risa stopped. We're not going down there. We'll take the cliff path. The cliff path took them closer to the figures, but descending into a sunken area of the road spelt ill will before Ayiklo had changed. Shadow beasts would typically hide in the dark shadows of such places. And if those watching planned an attack in general, it was also a place where that was much more likely. Risa kept an eye to their right, and Melia kept checking behind them. Thunder rolled in the distance, and the ground quaked again, sending stones rolling around them. But as they came up a large and narrow section of rocks, she caught sight of the sea. Do we even know if we can get off the island? If it has been too long? Even the merchant ships will have left. Risa paused, turning to her. If I have to swim with you on my back, we're getting off this island. If anything, I know we can maybe find a fairy who knows a siren. Do you still think you have friends underneath the seas? I know I have friends below the surface. Risa laughed. How do you think I managed to actually find where this scroll was hidden? The sand cows were only what that idiot thought I used. I took the ocean path around the eastern portion of the island. Not the most direct, but it worked. It also took you both weeks to get back. Well, in the end, she said, tapping the scroll, it is worth it. They say the scroll is truly worth so much that the wizard's college in Fadabrin will pay us a whale's weight in gold just to read it. Can't they then make more? I don't care. We'll be long gone. But that's quite a journey. Maybe we can sell it to the elves in Narisond. Or give it to us, a voice said plainly. Melia jumped and went for her weapon as a mace struck Risa in the head. She fell backward, falling into Melia and knocking her dagger from her hand. Melia gripped her with one arm and steadied herself. The Gill Mother drew her wand, casting a blast of fire toward Risa's attacker, engulfing the man in flames. He screamed, grabbing at his melting face as Milia turned, casting her magic along the rocks around her. Through the smoke and fire, she couldn't see her attackers, but she held Risa tight. Don't you die! she shouted. Her head was bleeding profusely and a portion of her head had a large gash. A sudden pain struck Milia in the arm, and she looked down to see an arrow sticking out of her flesh. She dropped her wand, and figures swarmed them. Drag them to camp. We did it, the voice from before said. Risa looked up, seeing a familiar face, but he was much different from before. It was the shadow elf Trit knew but his hair was much longer. You look at me like you're surprised. You will be truly surprised soon. You should have not come back to this place. They were carried to a camp some distance away, much higher than Risa and her had been walking. She was surprised at how high this portion of the desert was now, and she stared at Trit Nu walking behind them. The man was adorned in silver armour and had a large spear on his back. He looks nothing like he did before. He was a guildmaster, not a warrior. They were thrown by a large fire. Ressa was still bleeding from her head, but was breathing. Milia crawled toward her. Around them were bodies of others. Others of the race of men. Elves and it looked like even a few dwarves. They were being eaten by this band of survivors. I am no mere thief, Milia, Tritnu said. 
I was sent to retrieve that which was lost by my kin. I hail from Surya Del in the far southern Shadowlands, and when Ayaklo erupted, I barely escaped. I thought you were both dead. Milia reached Risa just as one of the figures began to pack something into her head. Milia pushed herself up as the figure lifted a hand. Wait, child, the figure said. That is Tiza, druid of our lands. He heals your friend. It is unfair that she had to be struck, but she was not as civil as you. We could not risk it. What do you want? Milia shouted. Do you want the scroll that bad? In truth, no, I don't want it. I never did. My people seek it, and I am to retrieve it. We have been searching this island as much as we could. It has been weeks since the eruption, and Ayeklo has had many nefarious types upon its western coasts. There is much to speak of, but it doesn't matter. You are in our care. Your guild? No, we are guardian priests, gatherers of rare items for the one you know as Wura. You see? Tiza said to Melia. She looked to Ressa and noticed her lover looking back at her. You're alive! You are alive! Melia said, embracing her. I am, Ressa said, but my head is killing me. Tizar nodded. A simple remedy, considering the blow to the head. I had warned against gratuitous violence, but my warnings are frequently ignored, Tizar said, looking at Trit Nu. Perhaps, but darkness is coming. Now we can leave. I offer you transport, Melia and Risa. We will take you to our lands, and you will be free to go. This island is an ancient evil, a place of the Scourge Siren and other evils. We do not know what takes place beyond our sight, but... Trit Nu looked above, seeing something in the clouds. He pointed. Are those... Dragons. Milia looked up, seeing the massive wingspans of several large dragons. Strange for the dragon riders to come this way, Tizar said. Yes, Tritnu agreed. They fly high yet beneath the clouds. They seem to be coming toward Iclo. Then we should go, another elf said. Get to the coasts. Get the mounts, Tritnu said. He looked to Melia and knelt. You and I are very different, but I am not a cruel man. Allow us to take you, and no harm will come to you. Trust me, this place will kill you otherwise. The scroll is mine. Agreed. Melia felt as if it were only a few hours ago when she had laughed at this man. But as the ground quaked again, she nodded, looking to Ressa, who seemed to be tearing up. Milia held her as several large lizard beasts crawled up and over the rocks. They were dark green with large black heads. These were the mounts Trit Nu had spoken of, and though Milia had heard of these lizards living on the far west coast of Ayaklo, she had never seen one in person. We have a ship on the coast. We just need to get there. These will help us immensely. We've been searching this island for the scroll by the will of the god, but it seems by his will too you remained hidden. I do not know why the god spared you and put us to work for so long here. But if I know Wura, there is more of a trick here than all of us know. He is a trickster, you know. That's why I care for nature, the druid laughed, climbing onto his lizard. In a few moments, the host was ready. In total, there were twelve of them. Tritnu carried both Milia and Ressa with him on his lizard. Move with haste to the coast. Let us be free of this forsaken island. They shot off across the rocks sliding down the smooth surface of several stones before leaping onto the black desert sands below them. Milia held Risa from behind. Tritnu was a massive shadow elf, taller than most others, and they were almost like children to him. 
She kept her head on Risa's back, and looking down, Milia could see one of Tritnu's daggers on his hip. She could reach it. It crossed her mind, but she felt Risa pull her arm into an embrace, and she closed her eyes, just happy they were both alive. For now, the coast was not too far away, but it looked nothing like it did in her memory. Massive curved spires coming out of the rock were pointed at the central region of Ayeklo, and steam rose off the waters ahead. The host stopped at a flat rock that jutted off the side of the cliff. Ayeklo has changed further, Tizar said. We'll have to pass back the way we came originally. Milia heard Tritnu sigh. Fine, he said. Keep close to one another and do not drift into the shadows. What is it? Milia asked. Our land bridge is gone. We had a path that took us from this spot down several fallen rocks, but, he said, moving their lizard toward the edge. It looks like even with the fact that these lizards can glide, we wouldn't make it. Milia had been to this coast many times. Lava fields ran all the way to the ocean, and it was clear why they could not go this way. Tizar took out his staff and led the way, pulling them further down into the rock of Aiklo. Even so, he made several bright flashes with his staff, sending sparks of blue flame into the air above them. We signal our ship, Tritnu said. It cannot come ashore, though. Aiklo has changed so much that it is no longer possible. At one point, the island floated above the seas, and if I had not seen it myself, I would have never believed it. The lizard was looking toward either side as they went deeper down into a valley that had somehow now flooded with lava. The lizard's eyes scanned the rocks around them. Milia looked up the path. It turned back up sharply, a rocky doorway leading to the bright light. She looked behind them to see only shadows and the red glow of Ayaklo burning behind them. We get past the tower and then slide down the embankment. We will be fine, Tizar said. It's not too far. Shadow fell upon them. Darkness blotted out the light above and ahead of them, and the ground quaked, sending rocks down in an avalanche around them. Milia held Ressa tight as she felt Tritnu draw one of his daggers, guiding the lizard around the falling debris and pushing forward. The lizard tumbled through the darkness, sliding to a stop beneath a tall spire that stood on the edge of a high cliff. Tizar and several others of the host lay unconscious on the ground, while others and Tritnu held their ground against shadow beasts leaping out of the depths, they had all just barely escaped. By the light of the divine, fall back into the shadows, Tritnu shouted. He had since brandished his great spear, spinning it about himself in a constant cycle, creating ripples of energy that flowed toward the blackness before them. The beasts attacked like a pack of wolves, but much larger. They jumped at Tritnu, who took them down with each attack, but they were growing in size and ferocity. Tissar stood, his staff out, but then he turned as more shadow beasts climbed up the embankment as the dark clouds swirling around Aiklo spread out, blotting out the sun and turning all to night. Milia stood, brandishing her wand, casting fire at beasts, now climbing over the rocks high above the spire that her and Risa were near. Priests of Wura, hold this ground, for I mark it sacred, Tritnu shouted. He spun in place, carving a circle in the rocky ground they defended. Several of the others did the same, now forming a great effigy on the rock of shifting white light that cast up into the darkness, drawing forth the polar lights from the sky above them. The dark clouds broke apart, and Milia saw starlight. As the shadow beasts attempted to step into the light, they were burned, retracting back. Tizar, 
Is the way still open to us? Can we get to the sea? The shadow beasts were staying away for the moment. The druid rushed to the edge of the cliff and pointed. I see our vessel. I see a path that leads to the cliffs. We must get there. We must leave this island. There was a sudden bright flash in the distance. The entire island of Ayaklo shuddered. The shadow beasts recoiled, falling back into the darkness. But the entire mountain shook more violently than ever before. We must go. We must go now. They began to mount their lizards. Tizar and several others took off down the embankment. Come, Milia, Tritnu said. A crack shot through the platform they had been standing upon. Rissa was against the ruined tower and her eyes were shut. Milia ran to her. Risa, we have to go. Come on. She didn't respond. Come, take the scroll and let us escape this madness, Tritnu shouted, grabbing her shoulder. Milia slapped his hand and grabbed Risa's hand. Rocks fell down around her as she placed her hand on Risa's chest. She was still breathing. Milia went to lift her up to carry her to Tritnu, when another violent quake shook the mountain. Tritnu reached out, but could not grasp her hand. The crack that had formed split, and they fell the other way. In a landslide of rubble and stone, Milia and Risa fell. There was a moment when she was weightless, and then she felt her body strike stone and they landed somewhere below where they were before. Milia's back ached, and Risa was bleeding from her nose. The tower still stood, but had slid off onto a precipice above a vast expanse of ruins underneath Ayeklo. From here, Milia could see the sea, but had no way to get there. She looked up to see if she could see Tritnu, but the shadow elf wasn't there. She felt her side and noticed she was bleeding, and it was hard to take a deep breath. Looking around, she saw no path for them to take. Melia, Ressa whispered. Melia wiped the tears from her eyes, seeing the situation they were in now. I'm here, she said. Are we almost to the sea? I keep seeing strange colours in my eyes. My head is pounding. I thought we were flying before, but now I can't move my legs. Melia pulled Ressa onto her lap. There was a clicking sound approaching from the ruins around them. Melia forced herself to stand, laying Ressa down on the stone. She drew her wand, holding it out as what seemed like hundreds of eyes blinked in unison. They were not alone, but death surrounded them. Milia cast a single fireball up into the cavernous room, and she saw swarms of shadow beasts. One came, jumping down just before Milia. She cast a flame, striking the wolf-like creature in the face. It fell away, but two more came. She cast at both of them, knocking them back as a third dropped behind her. She drew her dagger, slashing across its face but she held a simple weapon of iron and the beast seemed to laugh, biting her hand, sending a horrid pain up her arm. She placed the head of her wand on the creature's head and blasted it, forcing it to flee into the shadows. Four more beasts came upon her, and now more jumped onto the tower. Her wand fell from her hand. But then there was a flash. A bright white fire burned through the shadow beasts around Milia and Ressa. When the brightness faded, Milia saw Ressa sitting up, the scroll in her hand unrolled and fiery letters burning with green fire. The blinding flash had caused a reaction that continued into the darkness all around them, forcing back the shadow beasts and at least for a time saving them. Risa collapsed back as the scroll they had troubled for and finally obtained, the item that was to change their lives, faded into dust. 
Risa was breathing fast now. A bit longer together, my love, she said, quivering. Milia held her as water began to rush around them, as if the sea itself was devouring the island. It would not be long now. But a purple smoke appeared quite suddenly. She was about to shut her eyes and just embrace Ressa, when a cackling laugh that made her sick to her stomach forced her eyes open to see that the purple smoke she'd ignored was growing around them. A face appeared in the smoke. It was the genie from before. Kill her, kill her and I will save you. She used what was not hers to use. Kill her and her debt is paid. I will not, you wretch, Melia said. Flee from us. I cannot flee. Actions have been taken. I must support my god and the gods of the north. The genie pointed to her, and suddenly she was bound. Risa was lifted, and a dagger appeared in her hands. You are broken, the genie said. You will be restored, made into a servant of the gods, simply to pay the debt you have made. Kill Risa, and it will be done. This is the only salvation offered to you. Vanku, the god of death, opens his path to you. Embrace this new path and find life. Risa's hand was shaking. Her tears formed and dropped onto Melia's face. The dagger in her hand trembled, and she began to breathe faster, looking toward the genie. You offer me life at the price of that which I hold dearest? I do. An offer soon to be sealed. Ayeklo is flooded. The island will be no more. Embrace my offer or die. Risa looked at Melia. To take your offer would be my death. I will not let you offer such an offer again. Risa took the knife, flipping the blade. She thrust it into her own throat. Water rushed over them, and Milia reached out, attempting to grab Risa, but instead was rolled into the depths. She could see nothing but darkness. The pressure of the water was like nothing they could explain, but as she opened her eyes, she saw a glimmer of the surface far above. Once again, the genie appeared. I need one of you. She chose her path. Take my hand, Milia. You have incurred a great debt that must be paid. The stormborn of Trevara may have doomed the greater world. I have much that must be done, and still, there are those the gods seek to save fleeing Ayeklo, who will be devoured by the great seas. I have prepared a place for the faithful. We shall be a new island, and from there we shall make anew that which is dead. Milia reached out touching the hand fading from her sight as she felt herself drifting into unconsciousness. Suddenly, she could see the sky and felt herself taking a deep breath. She was lying upon a wooden section of planks with a single small boat surrounded by nothing but water as far as she could see. The genie took full form as a small man, walking along the planks and moving more wreckage together binding it with his magics. Are you a genie or something else? Melia asked. That is not of importance. I serve the god Wura. I make a place. You, you have now what is called black scale. Look upon your arms. Melia looked down, seeing strange black scales upon her arms and legs. She tried to rub it off, but could not. You are in service to the gods. This is your price for life. You shall assist me as I see fit. There are many adrift. You shall bring them here. Still, those of importance will find us soon. Then we will begin our task. We will honour the gods. You will discover those you know still live. You saved more. You saved Ressa. That is not of importance, but what is Milia of Scylla is that you begin. Go forth. Find those who live with the boat provided. Bring them here. 
he motioned toward the small boat off to the side. You have gone from a thief to now one who saves. To see who has lived, you must do what I demand for the glory of Wura. Is Reza alive? But with that question, Milia found herself in the tiny boat, surrounded by more wreckage and seeing a random person floating on top of a timber. She looked down at her arms, seeing the black scale, and thought of what the strange genie demanded. In the coming hours, she found many, and as she took them aboard her boat, the boat would return to what she could only describe as a growing structure set upon the ocean. The genie had made a literal small patchwork city of broken ships and structures. As she moved more of the inured onto the island of the genie, she stepped back onto her ship and looked up as several dragons flew over and circled the structures. Another host was arriving. She jumped back up to the dock, wondering if it was any she knew. But the genie appeared, holding his hand up to her. She noticed there was a shadow elf in this group, holding an unconscious younger man. Some of the other survivors rushed over, and to her surprise began casting their own magics. It is not time for your appearance, the genie said. That young one is the stormborn of Travala, and a disruption comes into our world. Many paths have been broken. He paused. But you must continue to honour the gods. Go forth and in time you shall learn more of the Stormborn. Once again, she was alone on the ocean. The sky was bright with starlight and moonlight. Somehow, though, it did not chase away the pain from her losing Risa. She felt she was right where she was supposed to be. A feeling she had not ever felt, not even as a guild mother in Scylla and a feeling only hinted at when she was with Risa. Though still, she was imprisoned to service, for now at least. But she wondered of this Stormborn and what actions he could have taken to now concern the greater gods of the North. I'll know soon enough, and maybe, just maybe, my love still lives somehow. It was enough hope to keep her going. Please review this title. I hope you enjoyed this short story. Milia is a primary character in Stormborn Book 10, The Dark Compass. The events surrounding the destruction of Ayaklo and the city of Sile are explained in great detail within the Stormborn Saga series. And I do recommend that you begin with Book 1, if you haven't already, and work your way forward. Thank you for listening. The End